Rub your eyes often? Blurry or double vision driving at night? Red light, stop. You may have keratoconus, a progressive eye disease which can cause vision loss. Visit couldidbkc.com to take the quiz. If you rub your eyes and are experiencing changes to your vision, this may be a symptom of keratoconus, a progressive eye disease that may lead to significant vision loss. Early diagnosis is important, so don't ignore the simple act of rubbing your eyes. Please visit livingwithkc.com. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Great news, you can now watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube Movies and Shows. And now you can listen to us on our new radio show, Open Your Eyes Radio, 1280, Minneapolis, 9 a.m. Central Time, every Saturday morning. Keratoconus is a disorder that, if left untreated, may lead to severe vision distortion and irregularity. Thanks to new, incredible corneal cross-linking technology, progression of this visually debilitating disease can now be significantly slowed or even halted. Today's guests, LASIK, cataract, and corneal surgeon, Dr. Netta Shami, MD, Dr. Shami is a clinical professor of ophthalmology at the USC Keck School of Medicine. And Dr. Gloria Chu, OD, Dr. Chu did her residency in cornea and contact lenses. She is currently an associate professor of clinical ophthalmology at the USC Roski Eye Institute, Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Southern California, Keck School of Medicine. Doctors, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. So I wanted to also mention that both of the doctors lecture, they're involved in research and have published numerous articles. Dr. Shami, I saw that you published, published over 50 articles on cornea and, and different types of surgery. Yes, yes, I have. And I have to say that I had had the pleasure of working with Gloria Chu and I've learned so much through the years uh, from her. And her contributions to the field are just absolutely immense and incredible. So, oh, you're I, too kind. Well, you you two have done tremendous research and have helped so many people. And on behalf of the optometric community and the public at large, I do want to thank both of you. So, I want to start the first question off with, with Dr. Shami. So, Dr. Shami, first of all, I want to ask you if you could help the audience know what is exactly keratoconus. Uh, well, first of all, thank you again for having us um, and, and especially for pairing me with Gloria Chu, who I used to work with for many years and 
sadly, uh, we don't work uh, together anymore, but I refer a lot of patients to Gloria for her help and expertise. So when I heard that Gloria is going to be co uh, uh, co moderating or, or being another, you know, a speaker at this, I was absolutely excited. Of course, I was excited to work with you, Carrie, but Gloria was <laughs> added benefit. <laughs> oh, I appreciate uh, that. So, um, keratoconus, what is keratoconus? Keratoconus is a, a non inflammatory, at least uh, that's what we believe, non inflammatory condition of the cornea, where over time, for reasons we don't fully understand, uh, the corneal integrity is, is uh, diminished. And so there is warping of the shape of the cornea due to weakening of the, um, of the structural integrity of the cornea. And that warping then can cause decreased vision. It can cause distortions in vision. Initially, it can start with uh, uh, increasing in nearsightedness and then increased in, increase in astigmatism. And ultimately, the astigmatism could be so severe and the warping could be so severe that it could lead to scarring um, and, 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 and uh, loss of vision. So tell us what pellucid marginal degeneration is. And is there a difference? Or are they really the same disease? Well, they're both part of the kind of the same, they're cousins, so in, in, a, in a way. So it's really kind of based on where the thinning or the warping occurs. Pellucid marginal degeneration is a condition that uh, similarly, there's warping of the cornea and thinning of the cornea, but with keratoconus or classic keratoconus, that thinning occurs more centrally or just inferior to the central cornea. With pellucid is more closer to the periphery. And so the, sh the way the warping occurs is, is different. Um, the other thing that differentiates the two is that keratoconus often occurs at a younger age versus pellucid manifests itself at an older age, typically. Um, Keratoconus, there's been associations with um, uh, eye rubbing, uh, other conditions, uh, allergies, Down syndrome, um, uh, and Gloria can chime in too. There's been associations to keratoconus that pellucid is less well understood, right? Because it's not as common as keratoconus. Completely you know, agree. I, I just called it a disease. Is it a disease or is it a degeneration or do we not know? Well, it's, it's, I guess, how you want to define disease and degeneration. It is, it's a, I, what would you say, Gloria? I would think it's, it's both. I would say that both conditions, keratoconus and pellucid, are corneal degenerations, but it's also a disease. So yeah, I would say both. It's a corneal disease. I and mean, one, one thing in, it's in the case, in the rare case that it's associated to Down syndrome, that's, um, uh, um, it's an association, not necessarily, I, I personally believe because of potentially related uh, eye rubbing and, and laxity of, of, of the lids and such, it's hard to understand exactly why it's associated. Um, there's, it's also some association to col um, collagen vascular diseases and such. But um, when I think about disease, I think more of a systemic, I suppose, I guess you could call it a corneal disease. It is more specific to the cornea. So let me ask Dr. Chu to jump in here for a second. What is form frust uh, so keratoconus? Form frust keratoconus, it's, it's very interesting and it's very difficult to find. As Dr. Shami said, if pellucid is rare, this is even more abnormal to see in clinic. It's essentially defined as a cornea that really has no abnormal findings when you're using your normal equipment in clinic, like your slit lamp, and corneal imaging like topography, but the other eye, the fellow eye has clinical keratoconus. So you'll see um, the bulging of the cornea, you'll see thinning, you'll see distortion in the cornea, but the other eye, it's not as obvious. So, you know, we know that keratoconus is a bilateral corneal disease, but one eye tends to be affected more than the other. So the form first tends to be more in the minimally uh, affected eye it's, I guess how I would so it, say. So it's yeah. kind of like an incomplete phenotype expression we, 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 yeah we, uh, or it could also be considered a kind of a because keratoconus is a progressive progressive condition uh, there is a start to it and before it becomes clinically um, detectable or clinically relevant or symptomatic there are certain signs that are mild and, and, and often require advanced imaging technology to be able to detect. 
And so form fruits could also be kind of early keratoconus that can yeah. evolve into keratoconus. Absolutely. And it becomes a real important issue, especially in a refractive surgical practice where one of the biggest um, uh, kind of challenges in, in uh, offering surgical um, options to our patients who are seeking refractive surgical um, options to have freedom from glasses is to be able to detect form fruits keratoconus, to detect yeah. that kind of early signs of keratoconus in a 20 some year old who may not yet have manifestation of the disease. And what happens, uh, Dr. Shami, if you do operate on somebody that has form first or, or does have keratoconus, what's the, when it comes to LASIK or smile, what happens? Good question. So, well, first of all, at least I tend to be more conservative. Um, Gloria knows that, right? I, I, think, I think as a refractive surgeon, I tend to be more on the conservative side, partly because I'm a corneal specialist and I see sequela when uh, one is cavalier about refractive surgery. So I don't operate on, I don't do refractive, corneal refractive surgical procedures on patients with obvious keratoconus. I don't think it's, it's a good idea, at least in my hands. So every surgeon has their own approaches. Um, I, I explain why. Yeah. So the reason is because I feel if in a, in a patient with known keratoconus, there is most definitely evidence, clinical evidence, uh, that's when on corneal topography, you see changes um, such as an inferior steepening or irregular astigmatism, irregular um, topography, um, if there's corneal thinning, there's evidence of uh, cornea that's already compromised. And so you then want, if you do LASIK or PRK on a cornea that's already compromised, you're, you know, the whole process of doing corneal-based refractive procedure, especially in a myopic eye uh, or hyperopic, you're thinning the cornea further, right? You want to reshape the cornea by thinning or ablating the cornea. And so if a patient already has known keratoconus and evidence of keratoconus, you thin that already thinning cornea. And especially in a progressive um, uh, stage of that disease, you could potentially accentuate the progression of the disease and cause significant deterioration of the vision. Um, there are so many better options. I mean, there's implantable contact lenses and such that you can use where you leave that cornea that's already fragile, untouched. Now, the challenge is form frust. So there are patients who are in that early stage of, um, of keratoconus or not. You know, there are cases where due to the way the eyes are, you know, the tear film may be a little dry or the patient, uh, patient's tear film evaporates too quickly and the imaging devices that we have may demonstrate a little bit of irregularity. Um, and and you know, here you have a patient who's a minus four, minus five, has been saving up for LASIK. Uh, you know, all her cousins and friends and sisters and brothers have had surgery and they come in ready to have the surgery. And then you do the corneal topography, you do all your diagnostics and one or two of them are slightly borderline. And then you have to determine is this evidence of form fruits keratoconus? Uh, thankfully, we have enough advanced diagnostics that uh, we really kind of take advantage of the whole gamut of options to really detect risk for keratoconus. But there are those cases who slip through. And there's also cases who have pr pristine normal findings on their, on their um, uh, diagnostic diagnostics for uh, refractive surgery. You do LASIK on them, and it could be that you caught them before their form fruits was presenting itself, and they could develop what's called ectasia. Uh, ectasia is kind of a clinical term of, of essentially keratoconus that occurs after one has had corneal refractive surgery. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but you know, I lose sleep over this when I, as a refractive surgeon, because I really feel like the onus is on the refractive surgeon to determine if someone has form fruits or if the evidence that they have, if any atypical findings may simply be dry eyes. And so I am often kind of looking for those signs because I also don't want to take away the option of refractive surgery from a patient who would otherwise be a great candidate. Um, so there is that challenge. So Dr. Chu, if surgery is performed, refractive surgery, and then you wind up with ectasia as a side effect to the surgery, how do you handle those patients? So that's a great question. And 
these are some of the patients that I do see in my clinic, unfortunately. So, you know, as Netta said, she and her team screens meticulously for any possible irregular cornea, because if you do go on and purposely thin the cornea further in an eye that's maybe at risk for keratoconus, it leads to what she said, ictasia, ictasia, which is further bulging and irregularity of the cornea. And this causes severe blur and distortion with regular glasses and soft contact lenses and leaves the patient in a position where they need to be fit with specialty contact lenses. And I do a lot of these fits either with specialty soft lenses, RGP lenses, which stand for rigid gas permeable lenses, hybrid contact lenses, which have a rigid center and soft skirt, as well as scleral lenses. And these are lenses that despite the irregularity can neutralize that irregular cornea to provide better optics. Now, depending on the extent of you know, compromised cornea, if there's scarring that developed, best corrected vision can be limited even with specialty contacts. And I think some of my post-LASIK ectasia patients are some of the unhappiest because it was an elective procedure. So they feel a sense of guilt. The doctor didn't know it, it was a mistake. It, you know, they feel a sense of guilt and it's just, a challenging situation all around. So I think with cornea surgeons like Dr. Shami and the degree of workup that they do to not operate on these patients is so crucial because in the end they'll have blurry vision um, with glasses, which they wanted to be free from in the first place and now have to be dependent on specialty lenses, which require a lot of care and maintenance and cost for the rest of their life. And sometimes patients even develop subsequent ocular surface disease in the form of dry eye, in the form of uh, pain in their eye. Um, that is very rare, very rare with LASIK or refractive surgery, but can be a complication. So these patients often do benefit from specialty contact lenses and topical therapy, but it's unfortunate that they have this sense of guilt that they wish they never had moved forward with the procedure. And, you know, you know, I don't see these patients often, but when they do come in, it's really um, heartbreaking to see, you know, what they're going through. And I, I, I want to add to that, that actually it's, it's, as Gloria was saying, it's extremely rare. So ectasia after uh, corneal refractive surgery is an extremely rare complication. And especially if the surgeon is using advanced diagnostic tools <clears throat> to detect those cases that are borderline or of question. Yeah. Um, I pride myself in turning, not turning away patients, but turning patients from a LASIK potential procedure to another not non-corneal based procedure. And we'll talk about that too. Um, there's also genetic testings that one can do because keratoconus, there's a, a genetic connection. Uh, so if, if a patient is, a, is questionable, I have done genetic testing. It's just the buccal swab where you do a swab of the inner, inner um, uh, lip um, and, or the inner cheek. And, and it's, there's basically now we have so many wonderful tools. It's very different than it was 10 years ago. So a lot of the ectasia patients we see now were ones who unfortunately had LASIK before the advanced diagnostics were available. And the other thing I wanna add is before doing the specialty contact lenses, um, most definitely the specialty contact lenses are life-saving uh, or vision-saving in, in these patients. But if there's ever ectasia that occurs in a patient who has had refractive surgery, and also we'll talk about keratoconus too, if, if keratoconus occurs and it's progressive, there is a treatment called collagen cross-linking that stops it in its track. So one of the things about ectasia is that these patients are, are already in the system. They're being watched they're being, uh, you know, they had surgery with with a corneal, uh, um, with a refractive surgeon. Uh, they are um, already kind of checked into whole eye care world, and so they tend to be caught earlier, which is fantastic because now a patient who has developed ectasia can undergo 
stabilization of that condition by undergoing collagen cross-linking. And that's a treatment that has been absolutely a game changer for yeah. keratoconus, for ectasia. Uh, and, and the goal is to, again, stop the, the condition from getting worse. And often it, it's possible to stop it before it gets to a point where you need specialty contact lenses. Um, so it's, I don't want people to think that they should be scared of a uh, refractive procedure because again, modern day refractive surgery, the diagnostics are so advanced and we as surgeons have become so much more aware of those signs and symptoms of foam bruised that the risks of really uh, doing surgery on a patient who would be at risk of ectasia has become far less. So Gloria, okay. this, br this brings us to kind of putting it in a package of the importance of early keratoconus intervention. So if you could, if you could organize those thoughts for us. Yeah. So I think we have learned so much in the last couple of years. Our technology has improved significantly. And all of these things are helping us to detect keratoconus earlier. And I think as a, an optometrist, um, you know, although I practice in a more specialty setting and tend to fit more contact lenses, the general primary care optometrist seeing comprehensive patients every day are essentially on the front lines to detect keratoconus at its earliest point. And I would say, you know, we need to be good detectives. And some of the clues that we can be looking out for are one, asymmetry in keratometry values within one eye and also between the two eyes. So if you're doing an autorefractor, if you're using a keratometer and you see K readings, which is the curvature of the cornea, and you're seeing uh, large gaps within one eye, say like 44 diopters and 49, or uh, differences between the two eyes, like you're seeing Ks in the mid 40s in one eye, and then the high 40s or low 50s in the other eye, that's a clue that something is going on and abnormal within the cornea curvature. Second is, is the vision. So if you're not able to refract a patient to a crisp 2020, and they're a young, healthy patient otherwise without any pathology elsewhere in the eye, you should be able to correct them to 2020. And if you're not able to do that, you need to be questioning whether it's some corneal disease or irregularity. And also if you're seeing frequent changes in their prescription over time, say, you know, they, became a little bit more nearsighted. They developed astigmatism now in their late teens or early 20s. Well, we typically don't expect to see continued myopia progression, you know, into the 20s and late 20s. Myopia progression is typically when the um, individuals are younger, maybe elementary school, junior high, and, and maybe stabilizing in high school and college. So if you're still seeing frequent changes in the eyeglass prescriptions, you need to dig deeper and perhaps order some corneal imaging. Um, and then obviously, we don't want to get to the point where we're seeing, you know, structural changes on the cornea through the slit lamp. But in later stages, you can see corneal thinning, little stretch marks in the center of the cornea called Vox striae. You can see um, what's called a Fleischer's ring, which is iron band deposit in a ring shape around the base of the cone and also corneal scarring in advanced stages. So we have better imaging in the form of corneal topography and even better with corneal tomography that looks at the front and back layers of the cornea together as well as the corneal thickness. We have knowledge now about what to look out for we also know that there are systemic relationships, as Dr. Shami mentioned. Um, we know that eye rubbing can make uh, the disease worse. And we know that there's also associations with atopic conditions, such as eczema, asthma, and allergic conjunctivitis. So if we're seeing these signs, we're seeing ocular signs, um, we need to question and make the diagnosis of keratoconus if that's what it is. So Dr. Shami, 
why do we want to pick it up early? Why do we? Yeah, want to great, up great. I was just going to follow uh, follow up by saying that. Um, I think that those were that was an incredible summary and a very comprehensive summary of exactly the the kind of telltale signs that even without advanced diagnostics, there are clues that one can look for uh, in your you know routine exam and and the shift in nearsightedness. Um, uh, in you know added astigmatism in your refraction, not being able to correct someone to 2020 uh, when they're in their 20s, uh, those are all concerning signs. Um, why is it important? You're right. I mean, back in, uh, up until about five, six, ten years ago, it really didn't matter whether or not you picked it out early. Maybe the only benefit um, was to encourage patients not to rub their eyes, but even that we didn't really understand that well. Um, but the reason it's really critical now for us to pick up signs of early keratoconus is because of the treatment collagen cross-linking. Because collagen cross-linking is so incredibly effective at basically halting the disease progression. Um, the sooner you detect keratoconus, the better off the patient will be throughout their lifetime. Because if you wait too long before your the keratoconus is significantly symptomatic, you, it'll still be effective in halting the disease, but you're now halting it at a point where the patient is already debilitated from their disease. So my goal is that no keratoconic patient will ever need a scleral lens. I'm sorry, Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it is your goal too. I mean, the hope is that no keratoconic patient will ever get to a point where they'll need to have specialty contact lenses, you know, or anything at more than just maybe a pair of glasses, or that they will be able to live their life without the worry of needing a corneal transplant. Truly, my real goal is that no keratoconic should ever need a corneal transplant with the advent of collagen cross-linking. Because, you know, it really is truly effective. It is one of the most effective treatments in halting disease progression. I, you know, there's, it's rare to find something in medicine that can have a 98% success rate in halting disease progression, and this is it. But in order to, for it to work, it needs to be done early. Yep. It needs to be detected early. So keratoconus needs to be detected early and the patient needs to be referred for treatment, assessment, and treatment. And as uh, Gloria was saying, there's two challenges to that. One is that a lot of these patients are not necessarily going into uh, uh, an optometrist's office or an eye doctor's office um, uh, and so they're kind of trekking along, they can squint their vision through their vision and such. And, and the second is that a lot of general eye care specialists don't have, uh, even the basic diagnostic tools like a topographer that can help detect that, uh, keratoconus early. So I, I hope, uh-huh. And we're going to talk about the different diagnostic tools in just a minute, yeah. but you bring up a good point, and I want you both to, if you both could answer it, uh, let's start with Dr. Shami first. So how about online exams? You know, that's becoming teleoptometry, online exams that may not have this equipment, you know, uh, you know, you're just, you're just being refracted by, I don't know how, with your cell phone somehow. And yeah. did, are you going to be able to pick up keratoconus with an online exam? No, I mean, unless there is some artificial intelligence uh, that is built in where it can potentially detect, you know, too rapid of a progressive myopia or too rapid of an onset of cylinder, uh, I wouldn't trust online exams. Um, I mean, I can see maybe value given how busy we are, maybe value a, 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 you know, having an online exam with a designated optometrist who knows you. Um, but to have it with this kind of robotic way where you have no relation and, the, and there's never been an, a baseline exam done, it does worry me significantly. Dr. Chu, same question. I think online exams are maybe only helpful in triaging emergencies so that you can be directed to somebody to address your problem. So if you have a, a sudden red eye with discharge, or if you slept in your contact and you woke up with the problem, or if you have sudden vision loss, at least they could triage you, help to you know, understand your signs and symptoms and direct you to a proper medical care specialist. You know, I tried um, telemedicine for eye, eye exams uh, early on in the pandemic, and it did not work. 
One, because a lot of patients have trouble on their end with the technology, even to sign on and to, to have a camera that focuses clearly on their eye, like you're seeing their nose and their forehead. And you're like, can you come closer to the screen and look up and look? You really are not getting a good assessment of their ocular surface, the tear film. You can't check their eye pressure. You can't check their corneal thickness. You can't really in a good way see beyond the cornea. And so I don't think online eye exams are very accurate. I don't think they're gonna be the way of the future, at least now. And I think it really is necessary to see an eye doctor in person to truly understand the eye. Well, I appreciate that. I have a philosophical question that I'd like to ask Dr. Shami and Dr. Chu, if you could chime in as well. Uh, the incidence of keratoconus in the in 1930s, late 1930s, was one in 2000. Now it's, studies show one in 50. So uh, Dr. Shami, has our genetics changed or is it because we're diagnosing things better or is it our diet? W what do you think has changed? Why are we getting, why are more people have keratoconus now? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 most definitely better diagnostics has helped. And I think that's the case with cancer, uh, uh, evidence of increased cancer, it's early detection. Um, and so it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we have early detection. Uh, I think there's environmental factors too. Um, uh, allergies are on a rise, atopic disease are on a rise, um, which may or may not be related to our diet or environmental changes. Um, but I think it's most definitely a multifactorial issue. Dr. Chu? So definitely with the increased um, opportunity to use corneal imaging like topography and tomography, we're definitely picking up keratoconus earlier. Also, I think education. I, I think, you know, when I graduated from optometry school in 2008, we didn't know as much about keratoconus even then as we do now. Cross-linking had not been FDA approved. You know, we have so many more tools now. Cross-linking was also started in Europe, I would say about 20 years ago. And I think as that treatment option became available, doctors were also on the lookout for patients to offer cross-linking to. So I think with better tools, equipment, education, um, as well as the advent really of cross-linking, which started in Europe, I think that's really what helped eye doctors, optometrists, and ophthalmologists hone in on this disease more. And I think that's why in more recent studies, the prevalence of keratoconus is reported to be higher. I don't think necessarily that people are just getting it more often. I think we're better at detecting it. You know, shows like this help get the word out to the public, making them aware of, of this disease, uh, keratoconus, or this degeneration or combination, but famous people that have uh, keratoconus are helpful. Like, you know, nobody's more famous in basketball than Steph Curry and Tommy Pham in baseball and Brandon Williams in, uh, with the Ravens. Rub your eyes often? Blurry or double vision driving at night? Red light, stop. You may have keratoconus, a progressive eye disease which can cause vision loss. Visit coulditbkc.com to take the quiz. If you rub your eyes, and are experiencing changes to your vision, this may be a symptom of keratoconus, a progressive eye disease that may lead to significant vision loss. Early diagnosis is important, so don't ignore the simple act of rubbing your eyes. Please visit livingwithkc.com. MacuHealth, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. So talk a little bit about Dr. Chu, about famous people that have keratoconus and how is that helping getting the, the word out? I think it's so important because in 
us common people, I'm a commoner, you know, um, we might feel very alone if we have a certain condition and feel like nobody understands us, that nobody's paying attention to or willing to treat or help patients with a certain condition, such as keratoconus. And I think when famous people are open and willing to share their story, it gives the general population more hope that, oh, wow, they have this condition and look at how successful they are. They're doing well, they're famous, you know, they're able to be an athlete. They, you know, they're doing well in their life. And that gives me hope that even though I have this condition, I can also receive treatment either in the form of corneal cross-linking, some medical procedures or contact lenses so that, you know, I can also have a good quality of life. So I think, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting baseball player Tommy Pham last year at the Global Specialty Lens Symposium. And he is just so inspiring. He shared his story of keratoconus and what he's gone through and what it took to overcome the visual challenges that he experienced. And it just goes to show that, you know, even if you are given a diagnosis of a corneal disease like keratoconus, there are things that can be done for you so that you can live a more normal life. And is Tommy Pham wearing, what kind of contact lenses is he wearing as he had cross-linking? Did he talk about it in his story? I don't know that. Um, I, um, unfortunately, I can't share those details, but um, I know that he has been seen by quite a few specialists in the field and that he's getting good care. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, diagnosis and uh, signs and symptoms. And you touched a little bit on it before, Dr. Chu, but Dr. Shami, what are the main signs and symptoms that your patients tell you about that make them upset the most or it bothers them the most? Um, well, symptoms that the that patients are bothered by um, would be, you know, mostly it starts off as nighttime glare and halos because you know, the way keratoconus starts, um, it's a distortion of the cornea, not usually perfectly central, but just below the central visual vision. And so when the pupil is constricted during the day, the vision is well-focused and the light's coming through the normal parts of the cornea. It's at night when the pupil dilates that a lot of patients with early keratoconus especially, that's when they first start noticing um, their vision having, you know, glare and halos around lights and their vision feeling distorted. Uh, and then they find themselves having to squint um, or turn on bright lights again to constrict their pupil to be able to see better. As the keratoconus progresses to a more advanced level, that type of distortion then uh, starts encroaching onto the centr central vision and pupil size then is less protective, meaning even during the day or bright lights, they still have issues. Uh, so most of the time it's, you know, again, decreased vision, glare halos, just poorly focused. And then they, what they also say on those patients who are not yet detected or told that they have keratoconus, they say how their prescription keeps changing. And year after year, they've gone in and Dr. Chu alluded to this, that I keep getting more and more nearsighted, but now, you know, now I have a lot more astigmatism. And, and what's worse is that my vision is not correctable. Like I don't see well through, even through my very expensive new glasses with a lot of astigmatism correction in it. And they come in thinking they have cataracts or something else going on. Um, so I would say, again, early glare and halos, and then it progresses to decreased vision, generally distorted vision, generally, and vision that to them surprisingly is not corrected by glasses or soft contact lenses. Uh, and then the second symptom is just allergies, but eye, eye rubbing is not something keratoconic patients complain about. They're often not aware that they do it. And so I, when I have a patient that I'm now, I detect the keratoconus and I'm describing to them what they have, I often ask them, do you rub your eyes? And they say, no, I never rub my eyes. And then I look over to their spouse or their sister or the mother who sit, who's sitting next to them or you know, in our room and they're like, oh yes, they rub their eyes. And I'm like, do they go in there with knuckles? And the knuckle rubbing is thought to be associated with progressive keratoconus. So um, 
I think I answered your question. So, so those are the symptoms. As far as signs, I mean, there, it's get, it would have to be really advanced. Before, what is we that? Sign, before we get to the signs, let me ask you this other question because you brought up a thought about pupil size. Have you considered giving viewity to these patients before? Yeah, they absolutely. Absolutely. So in those um, uh, symptomatic patients who differentiate their symptoms from day to night, meaning during the day, they say, I'm much better than I am at night. Um, and their keratoconus on corneal topography and the imaging is more peripheral. Um, absolutely, the, the beauty or pilo I did pilocarpine even before beauty. With the caveat that they tend to be, you know, if these patients are myopes, you need to make sure that their retinas are intact and they, there's no pathology in the retina to be concerned about. Um, when you're doing surgery on them, do you notice the cornea is softer than somebody who is doesn't have keratoconus? Not softer, but th when I've done corneal transplants on keratoconics, most definitely in the area of the cone, it's much thinner. So I tend, you know, I your your goal is to go beyond the cone. So my corneal transplants are usually beyond the cone, but most definitely if it's an advanced keratoconus, inferiorly the cornea is thinner, and as a result, has less um, kind of tensile strength to it. Now, do you think, uh, this is for both of you, do you think that diabetics have a less chance of getting keratoconus because of glycation? The tissue tends to be harder. And, and, and uh, when we're treating them, uh, we're, one of, the, one of the, the things that we're doing is we're making the cornea like can hard candy. So I, I'll take this one. I don't think that diabetes would really affect the onset because the onset of keratoconus is typically early in life in the teens and 20s. And typically we hope that, you know, we don't have rampant diabetes in a young child, although it can happen. But I think there's genetic influence in the family. Uh, you know, there's definitely mothers and sons and fathers and daughters and aunts and uncles who have keratoconus and environmentally, if they have the atopic conditions, if they're rubbing their eyes, you know, if they have floppy eyelid syndrome, they're sleeping on their pillow, that's also rubbing their eye at night. Um, I don't think that I've necessarily seen more keratoconus patients with diabetes than keratoconus patients without diabetes. And, um, but you know, Dr. Shami, what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you brought up, there's been a couple of studies though that have shown not so much less prevalence of keratoconus in diabetics, like Gloria was saying, but that severe keratoconus is uh, less common in patients with diabetes. Because they don't have like the cross-linking effect because they're, they're aging quicker yeah. and the cornea is getting harder from the- But I would, yeah, possibly. I don't think- I don't think it's really compelling evidence out there. And I wouldn't recommend you going and eating eating a lot of sugar to cause diabetes <laughs> to protect yourself against, uh, <laughs> against keratoconus getting worse. Now, uh, Dr. Chu, have you seen older people get keratoconus? You know, a 60 year old, all of a sudden getting keratoconus? So in terms of pure keratoconus, like non-refractive surgery ectasia, it's rare to diagnose it typically beyond 40. If I am diagnosing it at 40, 50, it's because it was overlooked or ignored for many years prior. So I think in those patients who have a very, very mild condition where they're functional in their glasses, soft contacts, they can see they're not complaining about the typical starburst or glare at night and they're living their life fine, maybe they just developed a very mild form of the disease where it was just overlooked for decades. And so I have had a couple patients where I gave them their first diagnosis of keratoconus in their 50s, but they had all commented that they've struggled with vision for many years prior. So it's not common to develop keratoconus, I think beyond 40, but you can definitely received the diagnosis for the first time, maybe because it was so mild and overlooked, but it's typically in the younger individuals where you're developing the condition. Dr. Shami? Yeah, so I agree with uh, Dr. Chu. Care 
onset of keratoconus, ex it's extremely rare, if, if at all possible, um, beyond age 40. So usually what we say is that it's an, it's an early condition. It's a condition of the teens and 20s. So the onset is typically in your teenage years, 20s, and it does progress and tends to actually stabilize around 40 to 45, partly because of the cross-linking that happens with, with our bodies generally. Um, and and um, I joke and say everything else loosens up except our corneas. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and so, but if it's ectasia, if it's po if it's a, a post-refractive surgical ectasia, then yes, you can have onset at an, at an older age. Pellucid could most definitely continue to progress beyond a certain age, and then you know, and then there's other kind of um, potential underlying conditions that are collagen vascular disease related, but keratoconus in its pure form is again, a disease of a teen and twenties. I have now, I'm sorry, with my, with my, uh, with my cataract surg surgical patients, I do topography on all of them um, to detect, you know, the ocular surface and such. And I would say it's not rare for me to detect or pick up keratoconus, very mild form of keratoconus in a patient who's never even heard of the term. And then you look at their refraction and they had had maybe about two diopters of astigmatism in their glasses that have been stable. And so they had undetected keratoconus for a long time. And that's where that incidence of keratoconus has gone up yeah. is that topography is picking it up when nothing else had before. And I want to talk about, speaking of topography, different equipment that with technology we use to help us with diagnosis. And let's take one at a time to keep it organized. Dr. Chu, tell us about corneal topography. What is it? How does it help us with the diagnosis? So corneal topography is a great form of corneal imaging that looks at the front curvature of the cornea. So unlike with your slit lamp where you could, you know, you could see the cornea, it's hard to get a full image of the curvature, like topography of the mountains or maps that you're looking at. Corneal topography lets you know where there's steepening or flattening on the surface of the front of the cornea. So it's a great imaging technology. There's some slightly more detailed uh, equipment that maybe we'll talk about, but that's what corneal topography is. It looks at the front surface of the cornea. Uh, Dr. Shami, talk to us about uh, tomographer. The, the, to, what is that? Corneal tomography, oh. yeah. So where corneal topography looks at the front surface of the cornea, um, and the front surface, the way it detects the front and surface elevations is by basically shining a, um, a light on the surface of the cornea. The cornea is like a mirror and taking that reflection of that light and analyzing it and detecting any variations in, in, in the way the reflection comes back. Corneal tom tomography characterizes the elevations of the front and the back of the corneal surface, and then also reconstructs the kind of thickness map of the cornea. So it gives you more information. It gives you a sense, uh, a better understanding of the shape of the cornea, not just the way it manifests itself in the front, but also the back. And then are there variations in the thickness of the cornea? And the reason that's important is because what we've learned through the years is that with ectatic conditions like keratoconus, it doesn't first start bulging in the front. It starts thinning from the back or bulging in the back, and then it, at later stages, does it manifest itself in the front? And so if our goal is earlier detection of keratoconus, well, then we need to go where it first starts. And that is to look at the posterior cornea or the back of the cornea, where those abnormalities first begin. And so corneal topography, uh, I'm sorry, cor corneal tomography is much better at detecting early keratoconus or form proof keratoconus. Um, corneal topography is usually in a later stage of the disease and, 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 um, and, and often is um, almost not too late, but if you really see it on corneal topography, it may be a little too late. You know, patients are typically very symptomatic if it's significant changes on topography. Why we're on tomography, tell me what posterior float is. Well, posterior float is just a term used, and I don't know how to just, uh, Gloria could probably do a better job, but uh, what a float is essentially, it's measurement of the posterior um, cornea 
and 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 based on the analysis that the, the tomographer does. It's just a term that I think was was used. It's a nice catchy term though, isn't it? Yeah. I always <laughs> heard that term posterior float. And I finally asked, what is the posterior float? It's it's with the tomography, it's the posterior elevation. I think it's that's yeah where they got it, it's not labeled as posterior flow. Yeah. So I don't know who coined that term, That's but good, it's just it's a good looking term, at the but... posterior elevation. And like you said, you know, that's where you see the bulging first. And so. So Dr. Chu, how can we use the OCT to help us diagnose keratoconus? So the OCT can look at structures in the front and back of the eye. So it can look at layers of the retina. It can also look at, you know, high resolution cross-sectional imaging of the cornea. And this allows you to really see if there's thinning. And you can also tell if there's scarring due to the reflectivity nature that, of the image. However, I don't think that OCT is necessarily widely used in primary care optometry necessarily to detect keratoconus. I think it's helpful to monitor the cornea presentation once it's been diagnosed, but you don't get a good overview of the shape of the front or back of the eye as well with the cross-sectional images compared to tomography or topography. So I think it's really great for educational research purposes, showing your patient what's going on. And even in the corneal tomographer, there are um, uh, tools within that system that you can look kind of at cross-sectional imaging of the cornea. It's not as uh, high resolution as an anterior segment OCT, but I don't think OCT is regularly used for detecting or diagnosing keratoconus. Also, it's an expensive piece of equipment. Um, and I, I don't think as many practices would have access to that. Uh, Dan uh, Reinstein looked at the epithelium and he showed that the epithelium was thinner in a donut pattern. Is that something yeah. you ever look at, doc, Dr. Shami? Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's, yes, I look at it, but I don't only rely on that. So I think the more diagnostic tools we have, um, the more we use all of them. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for the one diagnostic tool that would give us, that would be the, you know, the, the, the one and only that's going to give us all the answers we need. And there is no such thing. And I think we, um, I, my, in my practice, I have all of the diagnostic tools and I have patients tested on every single one. And then I kind of look at the, the big picture, the big picture of it. So epithelial mapping has been shown to be helpful, but again, together with other findings. And what people have found, what happens sometimes is keratoconus may not be detected on topography because the epithelial surface on that cone, on the area where the thinning is, the epithelium may get may, may be thinner uh, over the area where the bulge is happening. And so when the epithelium thins over the area where the bulge is happening, the contour of the front of the cornea may be red as normal. Mm. Does that make sense? So you have a you have a mountain or a peak, and that epithelium gets thinned. Well, it kind of can fool the topographer into thinking that oh, this is a normal shaped cornea. There's no bulge. But then if you look at the epithelial map, or or let's say the topography shows a little bit of bulge, where you would say oh, that's not a big deal. It's a very mild finding. It's probably nothing. But then if you had corneal to, um, epithelial mapping and you put the two next to each other and you saw that area that appeared to be only a mild bulge has a significantly thinned epithelium over it, then it's like, okay, you know what? If that epithelium was a normal thickness epithelium like the rest of the cornea, that mild bulge on the topography may actually look like a real keratoconus. Because so do you see like on its own is not that helpful, but together with other things, it can be. Right. If you don't have a tomographer though, and you, but you do have an OCT, maybe you could use the OCT with the topographer. Topographer. Yeah, uh, exactly. Now, exactly. This, is, this is a tough one, but uh, corneal hysteresis, do you, either one of you use it and how can you use it to help with keratoconus? 
I, I used it in, in, in a research study, and I think there is real incredible value to it uh, for research and um, on, in an academic setting. Um, in a clinical, practical way, um, unless you really want to geek out about <laughs> keratoconus, <laughs> I don't think it's practical in its current form. Um, what I would love to have is, you know, one device that's a keratoconus you know, detecting device, especially given the prevalence of keratoconus and how important it is for the gatekeepers who are the general eye doctors to pick, pick this up. If we could have one device that can look at the corneal epithelial map and then hysteresis and, you know, the puff test could, it could be like a form of a puff step test, but in its current form, it's too academic and I don't think it's practical. But if somebody has a, a corneal hysteresis, they have an ORA in their office, what typically will the what what his what will the cornea show? What will the hysteresis show on that test? Well, the hysteresis is looking at the tensile strength of the cornea, and, and it's been a long time since I've worked with this. So I'm sorry if I don't sound intelligent when I'm trying to describe what it does. But in simple terms, uh, it's it's looking at the movement of the cornea in response to a force, and and you know, and then there's standards of what a normal how a normal cornea would behave and how a weaker cornea, presuming uh, keratoconic corneas are weaker. Um, uh, and so it's that response, looking we'll at the lower, It would typically have a no, lower number. Dr. Chu, aberometry. Tell us about aberometry. How can we use aberrations to help us? So that's very fascinating because as keratoconus progresses, you have more higher order aberrations. Aside from, you know, your spherical, cylindrical, you have coma, trefoil, you have all these other higher levels of aberrations that can be very debilitating and challenging for patients. I think in terms of detection or diagnosis, I don't think aberrometry is something that we necessarily need because your, your patient may be good at telling you that they see glare and shadows and starburst at nighttime or with driving. And so that's already evidence that they are getting some degree of aberrations and perhaps higher order aberrations that can't be corrected by traditional glasses or even specialty contact lenses like scleral lenses. However, I would say that in the past two years, uh, the contact lens field has made good strides in correction of higher order aberrations. So if you do have an aberrometer in your office, you, you take measurements, you communicate with your lab, and you can try to correct some of these aberrations in a stable fitting contact lens like a scleral lens. It has not been perfected. If you have structural changes um, in the form of scarring, you know, even higher order aberration control will not eliminate the impact from scarring, but it can help to minimize perhaps some of the shadows and glare that a patient may have in the more moderate uh, to advanced forms of keratoconus. So aberrometry, again, maybe not used in detection or diagnosis, but really helpful to have this equipment in maybe confirming that a, you know, the patient's glare and shadows is due to higher order aberrations, maybe monitoring or tracking changes over time. And now taking that information and trying to correct the vision um, with that data. So Dr. Shami, uh, bread and butter, uh, uh, keratometry, uh, pachymetry, refraction, if you could take those three that every eye doctor would have as a patient, put yourself talking to a patient what they should be looking for as the patient goes in. Well, I think history is, is key. So history, first and foremost, with anything. Um, I think art of medicine really comes down to creating that um, rapport with the patient. History of eye allergies, history of vision change, nighttime glare and halos, and a teenager uh, that has uh, progressively gotten worse, eye rubbing. So, and then family history is is, is key. And then on auto refract uh, on auto refraction, 
Again, like Dr. Chu was mentioning, if there's significant difference between the two eyes, if there's more cylinder, for example, more astigmatism in one eye than the other, and the, uh, the auto Ks that are measured on an auto refractor, if the K values are, the steep values are significantly high, like 48s, 49s, that's definitely uh, a red flag. And if there's a significant difference between the two eyes. So typically in a teenager or 20 year old, there shouldn't be a significant difference unless they give you history of such uh, as a child. Um, and then probably one of the telltale signs when you refract them and, and it fluctuates or it, that you just can't get a 20 year old to 2020 vision. And you don't see on exam any, any other reason to explain it. Um, because keratoconus in its early stage, there's no, nothing on exam that can uh, point at it. Um, and so you, you, know, you look at a patient's eyes, they're in their twenties, they may give you some history of, you know, I have some allergies or not. And then you check and you see that their K values are a little on the steeper side. They have some cylinder, they have two diopters in one and then 0.75 in the other. And then on the two, two diopter eye, you're getting them at 20, 20 minus two. And, and they're really struggling. That, you don't need a topographer, tomographer, uh, you know, genetic testing, anything like that. I would say that's enough of a red flag to tell the patient, you know, I'm thinking I'm, I'm having a hard time correcting you to 2020. I would really think that it would be best if we do some more studies on you. If you have a topographer, great. And I hope you do, because I think now, given again, the advent of collagen cross thinking, every eye care specialist who sees patients in their teens and twenties really should have a topographer, the most basic form of it even. And then, but if you don't, then send that patient to someone who does and make sure that's caught early. Um, and I can't tell you, uh, you know, I've done a lot of outreach to our um, optometric network of doctors that I work closely with. And um, this last several years, I've done a lot of outreach and the number of times they have detected keratoconus at, at this early stage has really improved and increased just by them looking for these signs that I explained. And it feels good as an optometrist who picks up on it early. They have been so grateful. My colleagues have been so grateful to have those tools, simple tools to detect it early because you save someone from lifetime of problems if you can get them to have collagen cross-linking early. So Dr. Chu, we're getting ready to refer a patient for uh, cross-linking. Uh, what is considered progression? Because we need progression to be able to, to make the whole thing, put, put the whole surgical uh, procedure in motion. So what would you consider progression? How much does the, the refraction have to change? How much does the astigmatism have to, have to change? Honestly, I would say if you are seeing any degree of change, either in steepening of the K values, in change in the prescription, they're developing uh, more myopia or higher levels of astigmatism or even change in the axis. And uh, you know, the, the specific amount that is required for, I would say, insurance documentation and insurance purposes, believe it or not, it varies from insurance company to insurance company. So I would say if you can just track any changes, so decreased best corrected vision, change in their manifest refraction, change in their uh, K values, you're seeing steeper uh, keratometry values. Um, and obviously if you're seeing changes on their corneal imaging and their mapping um, from topography or tomography, and again with tomography, if you're seeing higher values in those uh, posterior elevation maps or the posterior float, um, you know, I would say if you're seeing even like half a diopter in some of the Ks, I mean, you really don't want to wait and say, oh, let's wait for you to progress three diopters. That is not good. And that's not what we should be waiting for. Um, and in terms of the refraction, I would say if you see even like now, this is tricky because with keratoconic patients, their refraction can change from day to day. But if you're seeing definitely like half to a diopter of, of um, myopia or even a half diopter of sill or a change in the axis, 
by you know, more than 10, 15 degrees, I would make note of all of those things. And particularly in the younger patients, if your patient is um, you know, between like 10 or 18, um, if you're seeing those changes, I would recommend they come back within even a month or two to recheck and not tell them to come back in six months or definitely not a year because in the younger individuals with keratoconus or risk of keratoconus, they're also the more likely to progress. And we don't wanna miss the point where we could have offered collagen cross-linking to halt the progression and just watch it continue to get worse where there's you know, no turning back. So you know, again, looking at K values, looking at your manifest refraction, best corrected vision, and also your corneal imaging. Can I, can sure. I comment on that? So as, as Gloria alluded to, you know, unfortunately we're sometimes tied with, uh, to the criteria insurance companies demand of us. And you know, this is thankfully covered by insurance, by most insurances, as long as you, you demonstrate progression based on what they demand, why, what the insurance companies demand. Most of them demand exactly this, which is one diopter, increase in the K-max or one diopter increase in the manifest cylinder uh, or manifest astigmatism or, or one diopter in increase in the manifest, I'm sorry, in the topographic cylinder uh, or a half a diopter myopic shift. And they require your vision to be worse than 2020. So I have this worksheet in my practice that if a patient is, uh, has a keratoconus and I, I request the records, and I document this because I want it to be covered by their insurance. And as Gloria said, if they're younger patients and it's not fitting those criteria, I have the patient come back within three to six months until we, because I believe that it's gonna progress until we just make it so that we can have the uh, collagen cross-linking covered for the patient and that the burden won't be on the patient. Now, I personally strongly believe that a young person who's between 10 and 18 or 20 with that first initial diagnosis of keratoconus, in my mind, is already sign of progression, because obviously they didn't have keratoconus when they were right. younger, and now they do. But sadly, the insurance companies don't recognize that. And I, in the perfect world, I would say anyone under the 18 with the first diagnosis of keratoconus, if they're, you know, if their vision is, if they're symptomatic from it, I would recommend collagen cross-linking. And, but why wouldn't you do it for a 2020 vision or someone who has, who's not symptomatic? Because there's risks involved even with collagen cross-linking. So, so I think close monitoring is critical. Detecting early is critical. Looking for those signs based on whatever tools you have in your office, it'll elevate and enrich your experience as an eye care specialist, knowing that you have impacted someone's life by detecting their disease early. And again, let's talk about the, I mean, the, um, Genetic testing is also a great tool. It's not yet perfect. There are definitely challenges in trying to kind of uh, use it as a way to really truly detect it. But using every tool possible in your hands would be really, really important. I also want to say that, you know, if a patient comes in and complains of new glare or halos and they're new to your practice, it can be very helpful to request notes from the prior office. And if you've compared those and they're different, bam, you got your progression. So you don't have to see progression yourself. You just have to see it in your patient. It, so if you can request prior notes from a year or two, or maybe you know when they had their first eye exam, when they were eight or nine, and you've seen changes, that's already, like you said, they didn't have keratoconus, they didn't have the visual signs, and now they do. Sometimes what I do also is if I see a young patient and you know, I maybe haven't documented progression or they don't have access to past notes, I will just straight up send them to my corneal specialist because by the time they get in to see the specialist, they're gonna repeat imaging. They're gonna check the vision. And if they see something different now, we don't have to wait another visit to refer them for cross-linking. So sometimes in the younger individuals who are at higher risk for aggressive progression, I'll send them straight to the specialist and they can decide if they're going to cross-link or not. And now they're on their radar. Yeah, that's perfect. So let's talk about management. And before we go over in detail cross-linking, 
Uh, the, the name of the genetic test is Avigen, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so for people out there that are interested in the name of that genetic test, it's called Avigen. So before we, we, we talk, let's talk about the management. What's the place for Intax at this point? So Intax, which is uh, basically intracorneal uh, uh, ring segments or intracorneal um, segments that uh, cause uh, a stretching of the area where the cone is to it with, with the goal and the attempt to flatten the cone or flatten the distortion or the bulge um, is a good tool. Not so much, you know, people think that it actually stops the progression of keratoconus. It doesn't. It's a tool to address the visual symptoms of keratoconus. And the challenge is these intacts have to be implanted surgically in an area that's already somewhat thinned and fragile. And so there is definitely surgical technique involved and a bit of unpredictability because everyone's keratoconus behaves differently. And depending on um, your the corneal tissue and the tensile strength of that corneal tissue and such, uh, uh, the segments are not as predict predictable. I've seen great success with it. Um, uh, with Intax, and, and I have also seen cases that really don't help the patient. Uh, the good news, though, is that, you know, they can be removed, and it's not the, you know, unless it erodes, which rarely do they, but it, it's not, um, uh, it's not going to prevent the patient from getting the next treatment if they, you know, if the patient needs a scleral lens or if the patient needs um, corneal transplant, you, they could still have it. I think intacts are kind of one of the last resorts before a patient needs a corneal transplant. I think prior to intacts, a scleral lens is a much better option. It's protective barrier to the cornea. It helps address dryness and, and ocular surface conditions that can exacerbate keratoconus. And it gives patients incredible vision. I mean, I've seen uh, Dr. Chu um, just turn patients' lives around. So. I think intacts have, are kind of falling on the wayside a bit with collagen cross-linking, with scleral lenses, pros lenses, and advanced technology imaging used to really optimize the fit of that scleral lens. I, I'm seeing less and less patients who are strong candidates for intacts. And I want to comment on that as not a surgeon, but one who sees patients who have received intact segments. I think the goal is to enable them to maybe get a better corrective vision with glasses or soft contacts. If they're too advanced and they have scarring, we know that they're not a good candidate for the intacts anymore. However, it's important to consider the age and also the pupil size that you're implanting these intact segments in because I've had a few patients come to me, the intact procedure itself went remarkably well. There's no complications. They're inserted within the stromal tissue. There's no erosion, no inflammation. Surgically, the procedure went well. However, at nighttime, in young individuals, they tend to have very large pupils that hit the margin of where the intacts are sitting. And they complain of excessive glare and halos. And um, for that reason, some of them have had to remove them. As you know, you mentioned, sometimes if it doesn't work, if it's not predictable, these plastic segments can be removed. But you know, in the, it, it actually doesn't make specialty contact lens fitting any easier. If it allows you to get into a soft toric lens, amazing, wonderful. But RGP fitting is not easier because now you have these speed bumps within the cornea that affect the alignment of a corneal lens. And a scleral lens, it doesn't matter how irregular, scarred, ectatic, weird shaping that cornea is. I can vault the whole thing. So an intact, it does, I've had patients that I've already fit in scleral lenses. Somehow they went to another doctor and had intacts done and they're wearing the same scleral lens over it. And I said, did it improve your vision in, in that particular case? No. And I said, is it better without your contact? And they said, well, a little bit, but it's so blurry to begin with, it's not noticeable. So I think selecting the right candidate in the really early, early stages is probably gonna be the best for the intax procedure. Rub your eyes often? Blurry or double vision driving at night? Red light, stop. 
you may have keratoconus, a progressive eye disease which can cause vision loss. Visit couldbkc.com to take the quiz. If you rub your eyes and are experiencing changes to your vision, this may be a symptom of keratoconus, a progressive eye disease that may lead to significant vision loss. Early diagnosis is important, so don't ignore the simple act of rubbing your eyes. Please visit livingwithkc.com. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.